Deuteronomy chapter 9 in our Bibles. Deuteronomy 9. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 9. I'll start by reading the whole chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 9. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak. Understand, therefore, this day, that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out, and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee. Speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, for my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go in to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee and that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until ye came unto this place. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb, ye provoked the Lord to wrath so that, he was, so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, when I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights, I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered me to tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence, for thy people which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten image. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make thee a nation mightier and greater than they. So I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire. And the two tables of the covenant were in my hands. And I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made a molten calf. Ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first. Forty days and forty nights I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which he sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also, and the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him, and I prayed for Aaron also the same time. And I took your sin, and the calf which ye had made, and burnt it with fire, and stamped it, and ground it very small, even until it was as small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount." And at Taberah, and at Massa, and at Kibaroth Hatava, ye provoked the Lord to wrath. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up 
possess the land which I have given you. Then ye rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and ye believed him not, nor hearkened unto his voice. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights. And as I fell down at the first, because the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. Lest the land whence thou broughtest out let the land whence thou broughtest us out say, Because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he hath brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Yet they are thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest out by thy mighty power and by thy stretched out arm. So Deuteronomy, I believe this is a chapter about the grace of God. And it's hard to think about that when you see just the majority of it being the, you know, the two major columns in my Bible, a little bit of this one and a little bit of that one, especially just emphasizing the rebellion and wickedness of the people. You think it'd be more about God's judgment here, but he's highlighting his grace, in fact, as he deals with his people and their great wickedness, but fulfills his word and his promise unto them anyways. In the intro there, in verse 1, we see the grace of God right away. It says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Right away, God is giving a possession over to his people. And it's a possession here that's not something that they could have earned of their own selves. It's not something that they necessarily deserved. It was freely offered and given to them by the giver, God himself. Now, this land, it says, is possessed currently by nations greater and mightier than the people of Israel. These cities are great and fenced up even unto heaven. Therefore, it's clear that this is not something that they could go and get themselves. It's not something they could possess of their own accord or of their own might or of their own abilities. And that's exactly what grace is, is God giving to you something that you don't deserve. It's a gift. It's, he's offering them something that they could not have earned. They did not deserve it. They were not able to take over these greater and mightier nations than themselves, of their own selves, but rather they needed God to give it to them. Verse 2, it says, A people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak. So the reputation of the people that indwelt the land at the time was such that he says, Hey, these people are great. These people are tall. And you know us. You know them to be those things. You know that they're great. You know that they're mightier than you are. You know that they are tall even. Of these people, it was said by those around, who can stand before the children of Anak? They were so great, so powerful, so mighty that the nations that surrounded them said nobody can take over their nations. No one can stand before them. If they go after a nation, surely that nation will fall by the hand of the children of Anak who can stand before them. And it's amazing when we think about the grace of God. It often finds people that are so unworthy of receiving it that it shocks those that are around it. Right? The nations looked and said, who can stand before this people? No one would have expected Israel. In the same way, we often see people saying, who can stand before God uncondemned? Who can stand before God without sin? Who can stand before God worthy? And they'll especially oftentimes look at you and be like, what, you're saying God would forgive you? All the things that you've done in your life? All of the, all of the sins that you've done in your life? You think God's going to forgive you? Who... who you think you could stand before God worthy without sin? Well, 
Not but by the grace of God. If it wasn't for his riches given to us, and that's a, a, a saying sometimes what people say about grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense, right? God gave the ability for people because of Christ's sacrifice, even the worst of people, even people that don't deserve it, even people that of their own selves could not have gotten this great and mighty gift, this great and mighty possession. Who can stand before the children of Anak? Who could receive such a wonderful gift from the God of heaven? Well, the point is, is that nobody is worthy of it, and yet God gives it anyways. None of us are worthy of his grace, and yet he freely offers it to whomsoever will receive it. And yet you'll still find those scoffers saying, who can stand before them? Who can stand before God? And that's what the people of Israel here experienced. They received something so great that everybody looked on from the outside and said, nobody deserves that. Nobody can earn that. Nobody, nobody has the might to take down the children of Anak. Now the next verse continues on. It says, understand therefore this day. Okay. So it's just interesting to say that he said in the first verse, you are to pass over this day, Jordan. And here he's saying, understand therefore this day. So they're about to make a big step in their lives. They're about to make a big move. They're about to make a big change. They're about to go from this side of Jordan and pass over onto that side of Jordan. This has been something long ago promised that their people would do. And yet the day has finally come. Hear therefore, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day. And here in verse 3 it says, Understand therefore this day. Now, on the day of your big move, a big change, a big decision, you better make sure you have some understanding to go with it. And that's what he's saying. This day you're going to pass over Jordan. Understand this this day as well. And we need to be cautious of that. Don't make big moves when you're in a time of, of d disorder, misunderstanding, not clear, okay? I've always heard from my pastors, and it suited me well in my life, that when you're a confused, when you're scared, when you're, you're, you don't know your right hand from the left, things are, are, are mixed up, messed up, you don't know what to do. When you don't know what to do, those are the times you just simply do what you do know what to do. You sit tight, you hang in there, you stand. Too often people get into a time when they're, they're confused, they're worried, they don't know what to do next. And that's the time when they go and they say, oh, I'm going to make a big move. I'm going to make a big change. I'm going to do something big in my life. I'm going to move away from this church. I'm going to go and do that job. I'm going to change, change this house. I'm going to move to a different place. When things are messed up and things are confusing and things aren't stable, that's not the time to make big decisions. That's the time to just hold on to the solid rock of Christ and just wait it out. Okay, and I've, I've learned this. On the day of a big move, a big change, a big decision coming up on the horizon, this day you're to pass over Jordan. Understand. Make sure you have some understanding to couple with it. And that's what he says here in verse 3. Understand, therefore, this day that the Lord thy God is is he which goeth over before thee. The first thing we should understand before we go and make a big move or a big change or a big decision in our lives is that God is with thee, nay, God goes before thee. Make sure you have an understanding of it, it being that God will be going before you. Don't walk away from God and go in the opposite direction. Before you go and make a big change in your life, a big decision, make sure you know and have clear understanding that God will be going before you. And this is what here Moses is trying to exhort his people to understand. That the Lord God, it is he which goeth before thee. Before you make a big change, a big move, a big decision. Understand that God goes before thee. Make sure you have that clear. Make sure you have God's presence with you. Next, you can continue reading, and it says, As a consuming fire, he shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face, so shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly. On a day of a big move, a big change, a big decision, understand that God as a consuming fire is there for your protection. And if you're not sure if God's there for your protection and is going to go with you, step one, then don't move. 
Don't go forward. Don't cross over Jordan at this time. You need to make sure before that big move, big change, big decision, you have God's presence and you have God's protection. Finally, there in verse 3, it says, As the Lord hath said unto thee, before that big move, big change, big decision, make sure you are going according to his word. Make sure you're following in what God has said. Make sure you have God's word in your corner and in your heart and you are seeking after what God said. Before that big move, big change, big decision, before you pass over Jordan this day, understand this day, make sure you know that you have God's presence, his protection, and finally, his promise with you. And this is what the people of Israel are made to understand. Hey, it's God that's going before you. You have his presence. It's God that is a consuming fire to destroy your enemies. You have his protection. It's God that is doing according to his word. You have his promise. Understand this, meaning know this and then apply it. That's what understanding is, quite simply. You can know lots of facts, but until you take those facts and apply them and use them according to in your life then you have an understanding. you got to know something and apply it. And that's a key to understanding. And the key to understanding that we find here is that the Lord God, right there at the end, is he which goeth before thee, and at the end of that verse, as he said unto thee. Know the Lord thy God is he, and as, as he said unto thee. Kind of bookends that whole verse there. Know God. Know who he is. Know that he is leading on before you as he hath promised. We need to have all of his promises eternalized, internalized, and walk in those promises. As God hath said unto thee, now you can go, okay, I have his word. Understand that he is going with thee. Okay, I have his presence. And understand who he is and what he promises to do. Be a consuming fire. Destroy your enemies. That assures you that you have his presence. Take the keys of, take, take who God is and internalize the truths about him and walk in those promises that he has made, even through his word. Verse 4 continues on and says, Speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying. So there is a danger that dwells in our hearts. And you can look back in chapter 8 and verse 17. It said, And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. You remember when we talked about that? The, the pride that comes to people where they get lifted up and they think that they have gotten the wealth, they have the power to do whatever is in their life, the next steps, the next journey. That's pride. And God brings that to our remembrance again in verse 4 of chapter 9 when he says, Don't speak in thine heart after that manner. Don't say in your heart that God cast out these people for any reason other than the reason that God gives as to why he cast out these people. Look at what these people are saying. And the danger is that when God does great things in your life, when he's there in presence, when he's there giving protection, when he's there for you because he promised, the danger is that our hearts will look at that and think that it's something that we did. Continues on, it says, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. And that's not true. God doesn't give us anything based on our own righteousnesses. God doesn't give you because of how great you are, all of your possessions and all of your provision and all of your family and all of the, the joy that you have. He doesn't give that to you just because you're some great person. That's a name it and claim it. That's a prosperity gospel. We don't believe that around here. God gives you things according to his own goodness and according to his own grace. God doesn't owe us a thing. God doesn't look and say, oh, oh, you know, Brother Vince is just such a good guy. I'm just going to lavish him with gifts and prizes and special things. and all. No, he just simply does that out of the goodness of his own heart and out of the grace of his own heart. Because honestly, if we got what we deserved we would go to death and hell for all eternity. So then anything we have above and beyond that is simply a grace of God and him extending his goodness. Now the real reason why God is giving them this land in particular in the context of the scriptures, uh, chapter 9 and verse 4, the second part of that, it says, but 
For the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out before thee. He's simply saying that it's not because you're so great that you're taking this land, but it's because they're so wicked that you're taking this land. God is using a nation on the heels of another nation that rebelled against him to set things right in that land by destroying them by the next nation that's to inherit it. And this is basically a tale as old as time. God uses even wicked nations to destroy nations that rebel against God. He's not doing it because the nation coming in is so great and wonderful. And we can think of Babylon when they sacked Jerusalem in the time of Jeremiah. Babylon was a heathen nation. By and large, Babylon rejected God. They were idolatrous. They were, they were wicked. They were worldly as all get out. But God used them to destroy his people that were in particular and knowingly rebellious against him. He's using others sometimes to punish the nations that go before him. It says again in verse 5, he's making it even more clear not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's making it even more clear. Again, reiterating the same thing. It's not because you're righteous. It's because they're wicked. It's not because you're righteous. It's because they're wicked and because I'm fulfilling my promise that I made unto the fathers through you, even though you don't necessarily deserve it. And the same thing is true about our salvation. We don't deserve it, but he's making good on a promise that he made many, 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 many generations ago into Abraham when he said, I will make of thee a great nation. That's the promise now that I am taking part in, not because I'm good, but because of God's grace. I'm accepting his free gift. God's performing his word that he swear way back then upon me by giving me something so wonderful as eternal life. He continues on again, more understanding given. Understand, therefore, he's really trying to hit this home. Verse 6, understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness. For thou art a stiff-necked people. I didn't give it to you because you're righteous, because you're not. Because you're a stiff-necked people. Because you're always rebelling against me. You're, you're hard-hearted towards my word, and yet I'm still fulfilling it. Why? Because I promised somebody else, and because of the wickedness of the nations here that are in there now, has rised up such that I have to finally judge them. Do we understand this now? It's a, he said it three times over and over. God will perform his word even if he needs to use stiff-necked people to do it. Okay? And God will do that in our lives too. Ultimately, we shouldn't be stiff-necked. We should be soft-hearted and prepared to do the work of God. But sometimes he might even use us in our rebellion to get his work done. I've seen it happen. You know, I'm not always living the best for God in, in the life over the years, but he somehow used me anyways in spite of me to bless somebody else, to, to encourage somebody else, to lift somebody else up. Have you ever been out souling and you just don't really feel into it? Maybe you had a really bad day. Maybe you yelled at a family member. Maybe you were grumpy that morning. Maybe, maybe you, you stubbed your toe and said a bad word. You're not feeling like soul winning that day. You give a half an effort and somehow somebody still gets miraculously and gloriously saved. It's not because you're so great because you're stiff-necked, in fact, but it's because God is performing his promise and because God's will will ultimately be performed regardless of what we are doing, if he intends to get his will done in that situation. <clears throat> Sometimes we, we talk to ourselves and we say, you know, how, how so? How am I stiff-necked? How, how am I so bad? I'm not so bad. There are worse people out there. That's just another, another manifestation of our own stiff-necked and hard-hearted. These people might have been wondering to themselves, what do you mean stiff-necked? Well, in the last few chapters, he's been iterating the story of Israel, and we've just learned more and more each time, each chapter, that, that these people are rebellious, and yet God is using them anyways. And here, there's another rehearsal of Israel's rebellion. He just goes over it again in verse 7. Remember and forget not. Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until ye came out of this place, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. I love that because it's, 
It, it's funny to think from the day that they came out, this great deliverance, the miracles that the people saw God do before them, they were rebellious from that very moment on. And I think of my life and I was like, man, I was saved, but I was rebellious from that moment on. I didn't just miraculously change and suddenly I'm doing all of the things that God wants me to do just in a moment. I didn't even know what God wanted to me to do in the moment. I was rebellious against it. And even once I knew what God wanted me to do, I still kicked against a lot of his commandments. I'm a lot like Israel here. From the moment... From the day that I departed out of the land of Egypt, from the day that God brought me out of the world and into his kingdom through my salvation, I have been rebellious against the Lord. Verse 8, it says here in Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. These people were standing there alive this day and yet... Many years ago, the Lord nearly destroyed them because he was so angry with them. And I wonder how many days I lived since my salvation where I was in the same state where God would have destroyed me that day were it not for my Lord Jesus up in heaven ever living to make intercession for me. You continue on in verse 9, it says, When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered me two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. That same day that they provoked God was the same day that God gave the covenant of promise. Now that's grace. The same day that God went up and literally with his finger sat with the man of God, preparing him the tables of stone with the Ten Commandments written upon them according to all the words that he said and also according to words that the assembly heard thundered out of the mount. The exact words found their place on those tables written by the finger of God. That same day God did all those great and wonderful miracles in Horeb was the same day that the people provoked him to anger where he would have destroyed them. Isn't that amazing? Man, we think of God doing such great things for us in spite of us, but one of these just brings it to perspective. And I can again think of times in my life where I was probably in the same state. God is doing great things giving me his promise, fulfilling his will in my life, moving me on to bigger and better and greater things in his will and to his glory. And at the same time, I'm just being rebellious and provoking him to anger. Happens all the time. But were it not for grace, we'd be in a lot of trouble, wouldn't we? We'd definitely receive a lot less. We wouldn't have gifts. We wouldn't have God's, God's care over our lives. This actually, though, when you see destruction withheld from a people is another avenue of, of God's love towards us, and that's his mercy. Now, grace is giving something that's not deserved. Mercy, on the other hand, is withholding destruction that is certainly deserved. God says, you provoked me to anger. I would have destroyed you, and yet he didn't. He held back, and that was a merciful thing for God to do. They deserved it. They rebelled against him. They were wicked in his sight, and yet he didn't destroy them. Verse 12, the conversation instead happens between the Lord and Moses, where he says, the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence. For thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded you, commanded them. They have made them a molten image. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. It's amazing here because right before that, in verse 12, God actually says, thy people. It's like he doesn't even want to possess them anymore. He's like, Moses, these are your people. They're stiff-necked. They made a molten image. Obviously, they don't want me as their God because they're going to go and make their own God. I gave them a commandment, tables of stone, these testimonies, this, co this covenant that is there for the purpose of giving them some order, of leading them in the right path, of 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 
follow or of, of having a way for them to follow and to unite under and instead they're just going to corrupt themselves turn aside make their own god leave the way that i intended and just reveal just how stiff-necked they are he says in verse 14 let me alone that i may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven and i will make of thee a nation mightier and greater than they god here is so mad that he goes to moses and says these are your people. You deal with them. In fact, leave me alone. I'm going to destroy them. And then I'm going to make of you a nation. Moses then given this insight and the severity of their sin comes to his mind. What's the first thing he does? He reacts. And sometimes the, the man of God is given insight, clear insight as to what people's problems are, what their issues are, what their sins are. And he doesn't necessarily attack them individually and 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 and, uh, and specifically but through the word of god sometimes those things come to pass and i've often said that most of the time if i'm picking on a certain sin that you have i don't even know it i'm just up here saying what god has laid on my heart what god has revealed to me in private you know something like this where god comes to moses and says hey your people have corrupted themselves they have turned aside they have made a molten image they are a stiff-necked people and then i simply preach a message that falls in line with that revelation to my heart i don't know who it is i don't know what they did i don't know the specifics i don't know too much of those things but if i preach the word of god i can deal with these things in particular here in verse 15 moses reacts he says so i came down i turned and came down from the mount and the mount burned with fire and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands verse 16 and i looked and behold ye had sinned against the lord your god and made you a molten calf ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the lord commanded you Verse 17, and I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. So first Moses comes and he reacts severely to the sins that he finally now sees with his eyes. In anger, he breaks these originals of the text, smashes them to the ground and destroys them in the sight of all people. Once these are broken, though, his mood changes. Now, that's quite often how, how the initial reaction is, 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 is just anger with the sin that had taken place. Moses here reacting as God is tempted to react, as God is desiring to react. Let me alone, I'm just going to destroy them and start over. Moses comes down and that same rage fills his heart, that godly anger, righteous indignant, he finds his people had done exactly what God had told him in private they had done and he sees this with his own eyes gets so angry that he destroys the covenant physically that god was desiring to destroy for real because the covenant was one of promise to enter in the covenant was one that if ye do these commandments then shall ye live and be blessed and go in and possess this land and all these things god said let them alone i'm just going to destroy them and even blot their names out of heaven that's how mad god was and Moses here acts out physically how God felt spiritually by breaking those commandments, breaking those Ten Commandments, those two tables of stone. But in compassion, Moses doesn't stop there. Verse 18, And I fell down before the Lord as at first, forty days and forty nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins, which he sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger for i was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the lord was wroth against you to destroy you but the lord hearkened unto me at that time also <clears throat> the mer mercy from the man of god came by way of him falling on his face before the lord seeing yes the anger that god had but also understanding and fearing the hot displeasure that would fall upon the people that he was trying to lead the people that he was trying to guide the people that he was trying to instruct when he said hear o israel understand these things live righteously seek after god follow his commands obey his words that it may be well with thee he's begging god 
his people that they would follow after God. And now he's caught in this circumstance where the people don't want to obey God. And God doesn't want anything to do with the people. And Moses is in the middle wanting reconciliation. Isn't that a wonderful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ? We don't want anything to do with God. God's turned in wrath because his wrath falls upon the wicked every day. And yet Christ comes and he wants to take the Lord's hand and take our hands and bring us together and say, hey, let's make peace now. And the only way we can make peace is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He did it all. And Moses here falls in that gap. He was afraid of the anger and the hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against them to destroy you. So he went and he fell on his face 40 days and 40 nights and begged God that he would forgive their sins and their wickedness and the provocation that they made. And it says here in verse 19, the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. Verse 20 says even Aaron was forgiven and he was leading the people to commit this sin. He even lied about it afterwards. He was the one that was guiding the people and he should have known better. And yet when they brought this, when, when they brought the idea that, hey, Moses has gone away. We haven't seen him. Let's make our own God. Aaron collected the stuff and then enabled them to commit the sin. And yet it says in verse 20, when Moses, as Christ, fell before God, it said the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him, and I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Verse 21, and I took your sin. And that's an interesting phrase. I took your sin, because that's exactly what Christ did for us, didn't he? I took your sin. Look down a little bit lower. And burnt it with fire. I took your sin. I burnt it with fire says that I took your sin, specifically in the context, the calf which he had made and burnt it with fire and stamped it and ground it very small, even until it was as small as dust, and cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. He took their sin, he burned it, and he sent it so far away by putting it in that river that descended out of the mount, that descended out of the place that they were in, far, far, far away. It was made as dust so that it could, it could dissipate and it could become almost nothing. You know, you know how, how your sugar dissolves in water and becomes almost nothing? Moses ground it down to dust so that it would dissolve in that river as it flowed far, 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 far away from them picture of Christ taking our sins as far as the east is from the west, I believe. Moses, I took your sin, he says. I took your sin, the calf which you had made, and I burnt it and stamped it and ground it very small and I cast it thereof and descended out of the mount. Their sin, their idol was destroyed in a forgiving act of God and God's man. Verse 22 it said, and at Taberah and at Massa and at Kibroth Hat Hatahava, <laughs> ye provoked the Lord to wrath. Again, it says, Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then ye rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and believed him not, nor hearkened unto his voice. They repented not, but rebelled. They repented not, but rebelled. They believed him not. They didn't have the faith to believe to enter in. That's what happened at Kadesh Barnea. The command of the Lord was to go in and possess the land. They should have. They could have at this time. And yet here they are standing again. God saying, today you're going in. Understand these things. Today you're going in. Remember how rebellious you have been in the past. Today you're going to receive of the promise. Even though you're stiff-necked, even though you're hard-hearted, even though your heart hasn't always been right with me, I'm going to fulfill my promise to you. But don't remember how you were rebellious, how you believed him not, how you hearkened not to his voice. And today you stand, think about the grace of God and understand the same things. How you've rebelled, how you've believed him not, how you've hearkened not to his voice. But here we stand, a new day ready to step into the next promise, the next opportunity that he has. Understand, therefore, this day where you've come from, the rebellion that you've committed, the sins that you have committed. Understand this day as you go in to possess greater and mightier things than were in the past, all of these things that had happened before. And repent. Don't rebel. Verse 24, it says, Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. What an amazing thing for Moses to say. Remember, 40 years he walked away from the people of Israel to go serve and, and be a shepherd and, and to he kind of put off the call of God for a while. 
He comes back and he knows the people and immediately he's just like, these are rebellious people. They won't obey me. They won't follow me. And God just says, hey, now you know how I feel. They won't obey. They won't follow me. And yet he still gave Moses the commission to go and to stand between him and them. How often are we rebellious, proud, arrogant, disobedient? We look just like Israel of old, and that's why the Bible promises. These things are written for our admonition. These things are there for our learning. Those upon whom the ends of the world have come, these scriptures were recorded so that we could hear them, see them, behold them, and use it as a mirror to look at ourselves and go, wow, that's me, rebellious. Wow, that's me, sinful. Wow, that's me, full of idolatry. And the more we meditate upon that and think about that, we ought to understand just how great it is to have the blessing of the grace and mercy of God in our lives. And how do we have that? We need to be thankful for the fact that we have our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever liveth to make intercession for us. And Moses is revealed here as a type. We see Moses standing before, the, fe before the, the fearful anger and hot displeasure of the Lord as he tries to protect the people that God is angry with. He tries to bring reconciliation to them. And all our lives since we've been saved and maybe even before that at times, Christ has been working in our lives to bring us to himself. All that time, Christ was ever living to make intercession for us. God, be merciful unto them. God, forgive them. Since we've been saved, he said, God, remember the blood. They're forgiven. They're forgiven. They're forgiven. Even as the accuser of the brethren stands at the same time, Satan before the Lord saying, condemn them. Look, they're sinning. Look, they've done wickedly. The Lord is saying they're forgiven. They're forgiven. Remember the blood. Remember all the, Remember that they've believed upon us. They've called upon us. They're saved. They're born again, ever living to make intercession for us. And that really comes to perspective when we think about all the things that we have done. The Bible doesn't encourage us to dwell upon things. It says, forgetting those things which are past. But every once in a while, doesn't God say, hey, remember and forget not. Hey, remember and forget not. There's a verse that says, remember that the, the pit from whence thou art dug and the, and the cleft of the rock from which you are hewn. Remember where you came from sometimes. Sometimes it's good to reflect upon all that was in the past just so you can set yourself right and get forward to the future. This day you're going in to possess nations greater and mightier. This day you're going in to do great and mighty works for God. This day you're going in onto bigger and better things. Understand, therefore, this day. What are those things we had to understand? We needed to understand that we need God's presence, we need God's protection, and we need God's promise before we go and make a big move and a big step and a big change in our lives. We need God's mercy. See, Christ says the example there in verse 25. Thus, okay, it says in verse 24, Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights. As I fell down at the first, because the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. See that type of Christ again in Moses, falling down before the Lord, praying 40 days and 40 nights, asking forgiveness as he seeks the Lord, that he would remember his people and his inheritance. See him also and understand, example, and I wish that we would have that same testimony. Here Moses is an example of Christ and he's also an example of how we should be when dealing with people that have wronged, people that have sinned. We should have this same testimony that when we see God's people being stiff-necked, being uh, a provocateur, provocateurs to God, when we see them rebelling, when we see them corrupting themselves, when we see them turning aside, when we see them given to idolatry or covetousness, when we see them sinning and doing wickedness, when we see people in our lives living like the people Israel, we ought to not get on the judgment board and start, and, and start pointing fingers and start, start saying, hey, you're doing wrong, you're doing wickedly. 
We all got to be a little bit more like Moses and like Christ and exhibit the grace and the mercy of God as Moses did. It didn't stop Moses from getting angry with God's people. He got angry with them. He smashed the covenant before them. But then immediately after, he went and fell down before the Lord praying. There's nothing wrong with being angry immediately when you find sin. There is something wrong with letting that anger billow and fester and turn into a root of bitterness in you. Look, the biggest sin that these people made was in verse 23. You believed him not nor hearkened unto his voice. These people were unbelieving and they were not listening to the voice of God. And that's the biggest sin that we're going to encounter in our lives. As we're in church, you'll be able to look sometimes at your, at your brothers and sisters and be like, you're not believing God. You're not obeying his words. I can see it. Sometimes you can get angry with them. If it's a personal issue and you're like, man, what are you doing? You got, you got to get this right. You know, figuratively smash the tables before them. There's nothing wrong with that if you have the right heart. And what's the heart of Moses here he's exhibiting? It's the heart of God. God told him in private he was angry. God told him in private that he was willing to destroy this people and start afresh. And Moses' reaction was to get so angry that he broke the covenant before those people, showing how angry with their unbelief and their rebellion he was. But then he immediately turned around and fell down and prayed. I wish I would have more of a testimony of that. But too often when I get mad at people, seeing them sin, seeing them break God's commandments, seeing them willingly disobedient to his word, I just let that anger continue to fester in me. I think we all have that tendency too. It's unforgiveness. It's, it's, it's bitterness. It's a problem. And then that, what ends up happening is the sinful brother isn't helped because they're just going to maybe balk up and, and rebel even more and get, get welled up with pride. But then myself seeing the sin, trying to help them out of the sin issue, I'm going to have my, my own testimony hurt when I just start to get angry and bitter and frustrated with them, and then there's this great divide and so wells up. But in verse 25, I love this, and I have it highlighted. It says, thus I fell down. In the beginning of verse 26, it says, I prayed. And that should be our marching orders. Okay, get angry at the sin. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. There's nothing wrong with, let's say, a parent getting angry with a child when they find that they've done something sinful there's nothing wrong with a brother getting in angry with a sister when they've done something sinful and sinned against the lord there's nothing wrong with that but it's got to follow up with i fell down and i prayed i fell down and i prayed now how do we pray then for our wayward brethren how do we get god's mercy in their life and turn away his wrath as we see moses did well, I think this gives us some examples, okay? First thing is verse 27. It says, Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor their wickednesses, nor their sins. This is a call to remembrance. What do we bring to God? Remember the promises that you've made. Remember how, how you promised grace and forgiveness to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that Christ would be the Savior that would forgive that person. So, when we see rebellious people in our lives and around us, family members we're angry with, you've been rebellious from the day that I knew you. Fall down and pray and call on God to remember His promises. Next, verse 27 in the second half of there, it says, Look not unto their stubbornness of the people, nor to the wickedness, nor to their sins. Fall down, pray when you see wayward brethren. Fall down and pray and ask God to remember his promise. To remember his promise. Also, pray that God would not look unto their stubbornness, their wickedness, or their sin. God, remember your promise you've made to this brother of mine, to this child of mine, to this friend of mine. Lord, don't look unto their stubbornness. Lord, don't look unto their wickedness. Lord, don't look unto their sin. But too often what we 
tend to do is we tend to personally look on those things and accentuate them and even in our prayer lives hey why don't you correct so and so for their rebellion why don't, Lord why don't you fix them and straighten them out for their sins and for their wickedness no 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 that's not what Moses did he was angry he got angry with them but he left it there he finished off he came to a conclusion of his anger he fell down and he prayed and he said God remember the promises you've made God don't look anymore on their stubbornness Lord don't look on their wickedness Lord don't look on on their sin. Thirdly, call on God to glorify himself and his word. Verse 28. Lest the land whence thou broughtest us out say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he hath brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Call on God to glorify himself. If God promised he would take this people out of Egypt to a promised land, God surely will do it. And Moses uses this opportunity to say, God, glorify yourself. We don't want this wicked nation to look in, on them and say, God, and, and say all these wrong things about you. We don't want them to look on the sins that these people have committed and then finally your judgment on them and say, the Lord hated them and your reputation be sullied. No, 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 Lord. We want you to to remember your promises. So we fall down and we pray. We want God for you to not look on our brother's stubbornness, his wickedness, his sin, his pride. And so we fall down and we pray, Lord, we want you to glorify yourself and be glorified. We don't want your reputation to be sullied. We don't want people to look on you and your word and say it's not worth a thing. And so we fall down and we pray. Finally, we need to remind God he's in charge and we belong to him. Verse 29, it says, Yet they are thy people and thine inheritance. Look, he asks all these things. God, remember your promise. God, don't look on their sin. God, glorify yourself. But ultimately, they're your people. They're your inheritance. Which thou broughtest out by thy mighty power and by thy stretched out arm. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, you're in control. Ultimately, God, if it's your will to destroy this people, I'm not going to stand in your way, Lord. But here's what I ask as I fall down and I pray. God, would you just remember your promise? God, would you just not look on their sins any longer? God, would you glorify yourself in this? God, you're in control. God, you're in charge. And that's how we ought to look and seek after God's mercy and grace for others. And this is what Moses did. And he exhibited it very well three times in this chapter. It says he fell as he did a four time. He fell as he did before. As he did at the first. God is being sought by Moses for the sake of a rebellious, stiff-necked, corrupted, turned aside from him, sinful, wicked people. Hey, these people were bad. These people had done great things. People will sin against us and be very bad and do very unjust, unrighteous things. But we can't let that destroy our testimony. I think this is a little bit of what we're seeing here. We're seeing God fulfilling his promise to these people in spite of all that they are. And through the story, we see this, we th we see this uh, scarlet cord of Moses as a type of Christ just there along asking forgiveness, asking for their safety, asking for them to, to be given mercy, to be given forgiveness, to be, to be uh, kept alive, though they deserve death. God, would you be merciful? God, would you be gracious? God, would you ultimately get the glory in all these things? It's an interesting chapter. There's so much more to it, I'm certain, but I'm thankful, Lord. Let's pray.